married and I got off the boat and was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, just don't get it on the uh, new plans in front of you. <laughs> no, we're good. Now uh, we did um, five days in Vineyard Haven and then the rest in Eggertown. And... Okay. I think we're ready to start. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Kathy. Uh, um, this is to formally advise that. Sorry, I need my other glasses to read the tiny little thing. Getting old, people. This is Getting advice. old. Kathy needs another different That's right. Glasses. This is to formally to advise that is required by uh, Mass General Law 38, Sections 18 through 25, and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, an act relative to extending certain COVID 19 measures adopted during the state of emergency, signed into law on June 16, 2021, and extended by the governor through signature on July 16th. 2022, um, the DISEC meeting will hold a public meeting at the date and time uh, noted above. And now I'm going to hand it over to the chair to take roll call. Okay. Um, if I could start with the people in the room. Uh, Stephen Britta. Here. Uh, David Reed. Present. Uh, Bud Nugent. Here. Uh, Rich Bilski. Steve O'Neill. Jim Sabin. Here. Okay. Having a quorum, we can proceed. <clears throat> Um, tonight, we're, our agenda has us getting some updates from Eric and his staff, uh, and I will just quit talking and go right to Eric uh, and let him take over from here. Sure. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, actually, not not staff, but sort of my counterpart in the structural group, uh, even though his name says Eric Galley, it's Chris Jones is here, and... Uh, Chris is jumping in because um, we figured tonight we might talk some about the structural system and the analysis that's been underway. And um, I know sometimes I end up kind of talking about it, but it, you may have technical questions beyond what I can answer. So I wanted Chris to be able to join tonight and, um, and be part of the, the presentation. Let me, um, let me just get my slideshow out here, Kathy. Um, Sure Chris is screen. smart having your name on that slide. That way, anything he says it's wrong will be attributed to you. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm going to go with this method from now on. <laughs> Even on projects that Eric's not on, I'm just going <laughs> to this, this name up here. <laughs> My favorite Dilbert sayings is, be a team player. It diffuses the blame. <laughs> it diffuses the blame. Well, uh, Chris has been in, uh, involved in really leading the effort uh, all along. Uh, just you just don't get to see him that often. So um, he's well versed in the project. I'm going to go over sort of just the the things we put together on the agenda. But we really wanted to start off with the boardwalk, and um, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Okay, and see that. Yeah. Um, and so just to kind of recap, um, most of our time I think will be spent on the the boardwalk design. I know some folks have a hard stop at 5:30. Um, we did have a rec commission meeting in June too that Kathy and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about later on if, if we have time at the end. Um, so just kind of recapping, and, and this is a drawing you've seen a lot. Uh, the idea as we approached this was to keep the, uh, the north-south legs on the east and west side uh, at a one-to-one -one ratio, and then uh, <laughs> elevate the boardwalk through the overlooks and uh, sort of the southern arc, if you will, to let a little more sun underneath it. And, and get that boardwalk up in the air. And the goal really is to maintain consistent elevations to uh, the greatest degree possible. So not have a lot of transitions up and down, but pick an elevation that works. And in some cases you can see the heights, you know, get, get to be six or six and a half, seven, seven and a half feet high above the marsh, uh, just because of the terrain. But, but the goal is to maintain a level elevation with just sort of limited transitions. Um, and this is what this looks like uh, in terms of the plan set. I know it's not in front of you, but these are the, the profiles that show on the bottom, they show the marsh and the boardwalk. And then up above, uh, this shows the geometry of the boardwalk, sort of where it fits on the marsh, where it fits in the land and, and how, it, how it works as you go across um, the arc and then back into the neck on the, on the Western side. And so, um, this has led to a process, and I think this came up a couple months ago. There was some discussion on what's the best way to, to support the boardwalk system. Is there an alternative other than helical anchors? And um, this is what we wanted to spend some time on. And I think this originated with some of the Conservation Commission members or maybe the conservation <laughs> agent at the time asking, 
you know, what about a composite pile, an FRP pile? And, you know, I think people got pretty interested in these and sort of excited about what the potential was. And so we spent um, some time over the last two months, I guess, since we last talked, looking at this in greater detail. And, and I'll show you those analyses in a minute. And Chris can, can talk more about them, uh, certainly if you have questions. But this is sort of what we've come to is some of our original hopes and assumptions were that we could use a smaller diameter pile in a composite. And, and when we went through the analysis, that really didn't, didn't quite pan out the way we thought. It looks like we need a 14 inch diameter pile uh, if we were to do a single pile like shown here on the right. And in order to um, maintain the boardwalk at the higher elevation at that area where it's shown in red, we would actually need a pair of composite piles. Um, so that would look more like a conventional, like bass hole, it'd be two piles and then a, a bent across the top to support the boardwalk. Um, these are the two composite scenarios that work. So what we're trying to do is maintain a minimum footprint in the marsh and try to be as efficient as possible uh, at the heights that we are planning to be at based at our width. And, and the way that breaks down is you could sort of do the, the north-south run on the east side, it's about 400 feet. You could do that as a 14 inch monopile. On the north-south run on the west side, which is about 300 feet, you could do that as a monopile. And then in the middle, you would have kind of a composite, which would be the duals. You'd have two piles next to each other and, uh, and a beam across the top on the bent. So when we're looking at the composites, and I'll show you that matrix in a minute, but that, that's what's working in a composite scenario. Um, and then alternate two, which has always been talked about, would be a helical anchor scenario. You can see there's two that support the bent across and then the diagonal brace uh, at these heights to keep, you keep it from racking or, or moving um, in a way you don't want it to. So the diagonal bracing is, it makes the third leg that kind of comes down for each of those. Um, this is a chart. So what we did was we had several different alternates and I'll, and I'll show you those in more detail, but this summary pulls together. So C4, which is here at the top, this is a composite. So C stands for composite. It's alternate four, it's a 14 inch monopile. Um, you know, Chris had been working quite a bit with some of the composite manufacturers and, and they're forecasting a 75 year plus life. Uh, we, we talked to folks that are beyond that certainly, but that's sort of what we think is a, a reasonable range for the life of the FRP composite. Um, it worked at this 14 inch diameter as a single. So there's its impacts you can see and you kind of run the math across we have 46 in the salt marsh and 56 total. And, and per location, that's roughly the cost of a single monopile in place at the depths that we need. Um, and then some of the other evaluative criteria that we wanted to share, it's an inert material. It doesn't necessarily leach down into the marsh, doesn't have runoff from it. Um, maintenance is really non-existent. You know, as we're told, we don't have a lot of friction. We don't have boats rubbing up against it or anything like that set aside in the marsh. And it's a fairly you know, heavy, heavy appearance and it's a fairly simple appearance. And that was one of the things I think people liked you know, before, very simple in its um, profile above the marsh. Um, also alternate C7, so composite alternate seven, 12 inch pair together. And you can see the image here at the right. This works for where the boardwalk's higher. So the center part of the boardwalk where the overlooks are, this meets the design criteria. It, it also has the 75 year life. Um, this is the square foot impact um, calculated here. Because we're driving in a pair of piles, um, you know, this option for the higher part ends up being you know, more expensive because it's, it's sort of double the material, if you will. Um, the environmental considerations, the maintenance and the aesthetics are, are similar. It's a very traditional kind of look. Uh, that you're used to seeing other than the surface being smoother um, maybe than you know timber pile would be. So the, the summary here is, is these two combinations. If you, if you pair them together, they create a complete system. So you can say 46 locations of the single, 32 locations of the dual, 78 locations in the salt marsh total. Um, you know the, the estimated value is a little under $540,000 on those. Uh, configured as composites. Jumping down, we go back through the helical anchors. So helical anchor option one, 
which is a four millimeter hot dip galvanized steel. It's a heavy duty wall. It's got the diagonal brace, you know, probably around 50 year lifespan. Um, you know, it's one of those things that's a little bit subjective because of this environment. Steel, even galvanized steel, doesn't always necessarily last as long as some people project. Uh, here's the math on the impacts and calculations and so on. And you can see um, under the costs, the, uh, the costs are a little under 5,000 per location. Um, things to point out, I guess, on the environmental maintenance and aesthetics, you know, there is a potential leaching, you know, the zinc does come off um, over time. And so that does leach down into the salt marsh. Um, under maintenance, you know, there's risk that the coating is damaged potentially if debris um, or objects get caught in it, if the galvanizing wears off or, or breaks through, um, there could be rusting, it could occur and could accelerate um, breakdown of the, of the steel. Um, if the coating's damaged, then you would have an accelerated repair and replace kind of schedule. It, and you might have you know, more frequent activity on the marsh than you, than you would under some of the other options. Um, visually, it, it's sort of, it's more common to see these kind of support systems on boardwalks that are lower to the ground. Um, so the posts look a little thin maybe. Uh, this might be a little atypical uh, just in terms of, so you're not used to seeing a wooden boardwalk supported on metal posts, but you've seen examples we've shown you pictures. Um, what, what we did learn when we kind of summarized the helical anchor is it, it needs to be constructed from the marsh itself. At one point in time, we were hoping it could be built in from above by working off the construction of the boardwalk. Um, but for various reasons, that's not going to be possible. So either case, the equipment is, is in the marsh. The permanent impacts are, are significantly less than the composites. And even the temporary impacts are less because the equipment's just that much smaller in, in order to get out there and, and put in the helical anchors. Um, and the total cost of those, if you project that forward, is approximately $446,000. And you can compare that to you know, approximately 537 for the composites. Um, so there's, there's different aspects, different features of each. Um, and that's what the follow-up slide is just gonna show you um, is sort of things to weigh, I guess, as we talk about these two options. Um, under alternate one, these are the two we just touched on. As I mentioned, larger equipment. It may be possible, um, you know, we've been talking with a couple of different vendors on that, but we need to be assuming that the equipment's gonna be larger to drive the piles, you know, all the way down into the ground. Um, there's a greater square foot of permanent impacts just because the piles are bigger, they displace more marsh. It, it may be possible to offset these impacts with salt marsh replication. Um, that's something that we'd have to investigate in a little more detail, but that, that seems to be a possibility. It would probably be near the upweller where there's degraded asphalt pavement. It'd be possible to restore that edge of the riverbank and offset the impacts of these larger piles. Um, the composites work. Just the combination are more costly than helical anchors. Um, it's visually similar, but Chris pointed this out to me the other day. He says there's not a lot of examples in the Northeast of boardwalks that are supported by composite systems, at least at this point in time. Um, we think they're going to last longer, have fewer environmental impacts, and, and it would lead to repeat less repeat activity on the marsh um, just because the system's going to be in place longer. Alternatively, the the steel uh, helical anchors, uh, you know, they're, they're tried and true. They've been used quite a bit um, in different applications over the years. It's definitely smaller equipment, uh, less temporary impacts, less permanent impacts in the marsh. Um, there's lots of examples of these being used for boardwalks. You know, typically, they're at a little bit lower heights, but um, it is a, a system that works for your application. And, and it's hot dip galvanized. So, you know, steel in this environment has advantages and there's also disadvantages, you know, in the marine setting. Um, so with that, I guess, you know, maybe pause for a minute. Chris, I, I've talked a lot. I don't know if there's anything else I missed or that you might want to add to, to what we've been kind of going over here. Um, I think that you did a, a pretty good job summarizing it. Um, I think this covered the major points of the differences in the two um, the two systems. Uh, 
don't, I don't think that there's anything I could really add to the general conversation. All right, let me let me go around the room and see if any members of the committee have questions. And I saw David, you had your hand up quickly, so why don't I start with you? Thank you. The the cost comparison in your chart is simply for the supporting structure, and not for the deck itself, right? Correct. Correct. For us, it, it's easiest to kind of compartmentalize this discussion because sort of what's happening above is a little more standardized, but what's happening below, you know, in terms of the pile supports, there are different options here. So it's just for the supports. Does, does the cost of the decking change at all, depending on which support structure we recommend? Uh, Chris, I, I think. No, no, I think that it, no, uh, the, the, the decking is going to be the same um, with either of those two systems. Okay, thank you. I just had two two clarifications. Uh, when you when you say the word composite, we you we we make absolutely certain that whatever's in that composite, ten years from now, someone's not going to do a study that says something's in there that's environmentally hazardous. We uh, don't know that. We never will. But but they, they yes must have, no, well they must have some idea of what's in it right now, right? And what's in it right now, I assume, is environmentally safe. Correct. Right, Chris, Chris. Well, Chris is probably a little more versed in it than I am, but the material is inert, meaning um, it doesn't leach chemicals okay. or products out. Um, you know, increasingly, I think folks are looking at. You know, composites have been around for I don't know what thirty years, probably. But in it, in terms of compared to like timber or galvanized or pressure treated right. lumber, that's a short window. So there's there's less known about them. To be fair, you know, your question. Um, but you know, basically, it's it's considered an inert. Um, it doesn't preclude like barnacle growth or development on the piling. Right, right. That can still but happen. But in and of itself, as you said, it doesn't, it doesn't bleed. It doesn't leach out. It doesn't. We don't have to worry about any and someone scooping up a cup of water and saying, "Oh my God, you know, we have environmental damage because of these posts." When you say inert, is that what we can tell the citizens? Yes. It, 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 it is, Chris. I don't know if you want to add. I know you've talked with some folks about it in great detail. You know, yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, I mean, I like to think of it. It's sort of it's sort of like fire, like fiberglass, like you would see on the hull of a boat. Um, right. it, you know, it's it, it's 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 not pure fiberglass. It's it's a, it's a carbon composite with with fiber okay. mix. But right. and in your discussions with the conservation, your meetings, they've never expressed any concern that no have they? they've, they've actually requested that some private dock uh developers you know private ones actually use, use them. okay yeah. okay that's fine i just wanted to make sure that we're not investing in something that 10 years from now someone's yeah. going to say you got to replace it all okay we have a sense as to which system is more supported by the conservation commission which one they would prefer mm -hmm. uh, yes you said there's so. pluses and minuses on each but okay um good question but do you have any questions um how much of an effect on the marsh does the additional square inches cubic inches of penetration with the um composite piles going to cause versus the helical anchors i know it's just a few inches but yeah is that an issue a, or not it's about it's about a, at this point we think it's about a hundred square feet. So, you know, the difference is the helicals might represent twenty-five square feet, and the composites might represent one hundred and twenty-five square feet of impact. So, you know, we would, I, I think, we would want to try to offset that impact in some way to, you know, kind of equalize the overall impacts to the marsh if if that option is pursued. Yeah, and I don't know that it's really that that big a deal. I mean, the marsh is going to fill in pretty quickly. I'm just curious if you know something I don't know. <laughs> well, the, the, the regulatory agencies are, are typically, they would require uh, replication of any, any permanent impacts to the marsh. So they, um, you're, and there's a, a multiplier applied but if we break, we got to fix. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You, usually, usually it's a two to one ratio. So if you have a permanent impact to 25 square feet of marsh, you are uh, usually 
advise that your project needs to include replication of uh, 50, 50 square feet of new marsh. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions? From okay. Me? So I'll, I'll I'll jump in with a couple of quick ones if I can. Um, my first question is: Are the composite piles are they hollow? And if not, what do we fill them with? They are hollow. Okay. Do we would we fill them or should we fill them? Well, there 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 is you could fill them with concrete, um, which would actually, uh, if you were to do that, were to you you could go probably go get smaller diameter piles if you were to do that. But there you have an issue of how are you going to get concrete? Out of the okay. So we don't think that's a good idea. Got it. And they, they're fine just the way they are. Yes. Um, so my next is a couple of quick comments. Um, you know, I look at the, the galvanized steel and I spend an awful lot of time at the Inglewood Beach Pier. And that thing has been replaced probably five times in the last 10 years. And I'm assuming they're using galvanized steel for the railings, but um, it does just what you say. It, it breaks down if you chip it or, you know, it's um, in 50 years versus 75. Um, your comment that um, the compost piles are more expensive, I would agree on an upfront cost. But if I quickly calculate it out, if we were assume them to live the life expectancies that have been determined at 75 and 50, then actually the life expectancy cost over the over the long term, uh, it's less expensive for the composite by over a thousand dollars a year. That's like 80, 81 hundred per year for 50 years and the 400 and something, but it's only seven thousand dollars and change per year over 75. So it's really in the long run um, less expensive. Uh, upfront cost, yes, yeah, but more long term, upfront, but long term, I think. Uh, that's great advantages. Aesthetically, I like the look of them better. Um, it seems to me like our engineers are recommending or leaning towards the idea of the composite pile uh, as, as a preferred method. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Eric. And uh, but, um, <laughs> Yeah, I think, well, uh, maybe it's a good chance for Chris to talk about it. I, I want to put up a slide. You know, we've looked at a lot of different combinations to explore what might work best in composites. And um, you can see the 12 inch, the eight inch, the 10 inch, these are all the C alternates on one page here together. A lot of different combinations. And early on, we were optimistic that the smaller diameters, we could get them stiff enough, they could be rigid enough and the deflection would be low enough that they would have a really small square foot impact and, and a good price point. What we found is we really needed to be in these larger size 12s and set and 14s um, to make to make the system work. I think that as that got larger, it got more expensive and the impacts got greater, um, which really brings it to kind of you know equal footing between the two options. I think when you look at these composites in a residential setting, you know, they're not really held to the same requirements that we are in a, designing a public boardwalk. And this is also probably four feet wide. So it's, it's a lot narrower than the system that, you know, the town's looking to have on the marsh. Um, so they're, they're similar structures, but they're, they're different um, in terms of what you need to do in the public setting. And that all leads to the composites just having you know, a bigger footprint and being more expensive. I think the Helicals, and this is a good example of them here. We thought about and talked about these a lot in the past, and we looked at these in combination with several other options. You can see the encased helicals here, a hybrid helical, which was helical below the marsh and wood timber above, uh, had some complications with the union. And, um, you know, we even think, thought about a little bit about wood piles at the, at the beginning. So there were several different scenarios that were investigated as possible supports. So that kind of takes it on the full tour, you know, all the way around. Chris, I don't know, they're asking you sort of where, where you land on this in terms of, you know, the best structural solution. You have an opinion that you can give them? Well, I mean, my, I, I've, come, I've come full circle on this, um, in, in my opinion. I um, had 
when this first started, I had expressed some reservations about using helical piles. And I suggested that, you know, that some alternates be looked at. Um, and I was initially excited about the composites and the potential there. Our geotechnical subconsultant um, did express concerns with um, the flexibility of the piles. And once we performed, uh, once they performed some preliminary analysis, those concerns were borne out. Um, and um, the piles, the piles are very flexible. And because of the heights that this boardwalk is uh, is at, um, there tends to be a lot of deflection under the loading conditions that we have to design for because this is a public structure. Uh, and so the piles are now bigger than we thought that they they might be. And so the, si the size of the piles uh, has led to the increased costs and increased marsh impacts. So I've come full around and I'm, I'm thinking now that, you know, maybe helical piles are, are the way to go here because, um, my main concern whenever we're in an environment like this is what are the permitting agencies going to allow? And the permitting agencies, when you're dealing with salt marsh, always want to look to, the, to see that you evaluated options that have absolutely minimized the amount of impacts on the marsh. Um, and so there, we, we have a situation here where you have comparable systems um, and one with, even though you're dealing with an overall magnitude, that's really not that great, you know, uh, 25 square feet of permanent impacts versus 125, you know, in the real world, that's a small area, but when you're talking salt marsh impacts, that's a big difference. Um, and so the, the agencies will take that into consideration when they review your project. And the other thing is the longevity. That, that is, of course, a, a big advantage that the, that the composite piles um, uh, have. But um, we can sort of design around that with the helical piles. I've talked to uh, some fabricators and some specialty contractors that work with the helical piles and uh, their suggestions of using um, you know, an extra thick zinc coating and designing the helical piles themselves with extra, extra thick walls to make sure that um, as, the, as the zinc gets eaten up, it takes longer to eat through, um, it, it takes longer to, um, to get used up in the corrosion process. And then when the steel itself, if that starts to corrode, you have an extra thick layer of steel there. So I, 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 I've, I've kind of come around to thinking that maybe uh, the town should go with the, with the helical piles for those reasons. Let me ask another quick question if I can. I forgot to ask this before. Um, uh, availability of materials, is it similar as far as being able to get either the composite or the helix uh, materials or? Uh, as far as I'm aware, but they're both fairly similar right now. The uh, composites, uh, I'm, I'm told that they have some limited availability on the structural shapes, but the piles, um, I think that there, are, there aren't any issues with that right now. Anybody else have any questions? So is the bottom line that both of you agree that that the helical is probably the way we should be heading right now yeah i think that eric number one <laughs> <laughs> yeah eric well you heard it first from eric yeah the other eric i mean on the structural side chris chris highlighted you know all the factors and i think he talked a little bit about how to make it work as best as it can you know for you um by thickening the wall and thickening the coating um i think on the some of the considerations I guess I was more acquainted with was sort of what are the aesthetic values, you know, to the system. And I, I think we, it's important to keep in mind there is vegetation, you know, existing on either sides of the um, boardwalk as proposed and there'll be vegetation under it and around it as well. And so I think all of that vegetation will serve to 
sort of blend in the support system. And so even though in some of these drawings, you know, that we use, um, they're not, you know, we don't maybe show all the vegetation that's involved. Uh, you definitely would have an effect of kind of um, blending it into the marsh and blending it into the setting. And if you look at um, these guys, you can see kind of the contrast against the water. And if you take a look at, you know, sort of how it works and looks in the marsh, you know, this is a relatively low marsh setting. Um, you've got the high tide bush and some other shrubby material because we're really installing most of this right at the high tide line. Um, so I think you're going to have vegetation that's going to kind of heal the boardwalk in and settle it into its, its surroundings. And, you know, I think in that regard, based on the structural, you know, considerations that Chris put forward, um, I, I, I can see supporting um, the helical anchors as well as, as the system that, that is a good fit for this project. I, I will I will add that you know the the aesthetics of the composites or you know it clearly has an advantage with a nice cleaner look but um, you know as a structural engineer I'm not really it's not <laughs> I'm dealing with you know that's more of our point of view. Oh, I kind so, of think that helix one looks okay to me. The, yeah. so can I just just to, so Susan? even though even though the the um, composite looks better. From a regulatory point of view, from the permitting agency's point of view, that is not a main criteria. The main criteria is impact on the salt marsh. And one, the, the composite pile has a larger impact than the, hel the helical, is that correct? So if we were to roll the dice, we have at least a 50% chance it would not get approved, maybe even higher. If in fact, if they were to order their criteria, impact on the marsh is very, very serious to the permitting agencies, is that correct? Yeah. It, it, yes, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't speak to the chances of it, them right. doing it, but they, they've already been, they've already seen, we've already had a meeting right. with some of the regulatory people um, early on and showed the right. you know, concept of helical piles and they were agreeable to that. So okay, so that answers your question. Okay. They have in their mind that, okay, they're going with helical piles and it seems to be a reasonable approach. So it could be a case where they, if you came back with larger piles with more permanent impacts, <laughs> gonna want to know why. Stop. You can <laughs> end the conversation. I, I totally agree. So based, really upon the recommend, right, based upon the recommendations of our engineer and um, uh, is it uh, the agreement of the committee members that we should instruct them to proceed with planning based upon the helic anchor system? Yep. Yes. Everybody agree to that? Yes, yes. yes. Bud? Bud shaking his head, yes. Two thumb, one thumbs up. Yeah. I guess he's got another thumb somewhere. Yeah, up. we don't want to snatch. Okay, so from the jaws of outstanding. I think that's excellent. And uh, we will obviously continue to listen to the recommendations of our engineers and our experts. So let's move to the next section. And I think you get what we think is a way to go. You look anxious it is. Why you guys get paid? <laughs> No, thank you for, for acting on it. And I'm glad that, you know, you're able to evaluate the criteria and, and make the decision. Um, yeah, although I have to tell you, the, the information you shared about the regulatory and the permitting agencies is what made me swing from composite to helical. Yeah. We don't want to embark on something that we know may not pass. We want to set the certainty at this point. Yeah. And we're already asking for like the one to one, so that's yeah a little off minimum. Beginning. Right, we right. want to keep right. that six feet. Let's not yeah. forget we want to keep yeah. that. So. Outstanding. Want to talk about the footbridge, Eric? Yeah, I, I wish I had uh, more to say, but I'll I'll kind of put this slide up and we can. We Looks can like a footbridge. This. Looks yeah, like a footbridge to me. Uh, what I'd like what I'd like your permission to do um, is is if you'll let us continue to kind of talk about composites. I know there were some conversations about you know, really wanting the footbridge to match the character of the boardwalk. And so one of the challenges for us is, you know, you know, how do we do that? Rich isn't here tonight, so maybe this is, is better left in, in some detail for another conversation. But, uh, you know, we'd like to look at this and see if we can use a composite um, system and maybe use a wood cladding to kind of make it appear like it's um, the same as the boardwalk. Um, but using composites, I think it will allow us to span over the creek. And we, we really don't want to put any pilings in the creek or the little inlet that comes in there. We want to avoid that and uh, span over it entirely. 
I know there was some talk about doing it as a prefabricated bridge and, and kind of bringing it into the site. Um, that's going to require a lot of clearing. I'll go back to one of these images. It would require a lot of clearing. We'd essentially have to cut open this road, you know, all the way in and looking at the footprint and the staging area for a crane uh, really gets fairly involved, even for, you know, this is about a 40 foot span across the creek right here. Um, you so couldn't we bring that on a barge, could you? Uh, we we talked a little direction. bit about that. You just can't get really close enough. Can't get close enough? Yeah. Um, you know, a, a large enough helicopter, you know, certainly they, they do it in some places that way. Um, and so I watched them put a 30 foot hot tub up 60 <laughs> feet over the top of my house and put it within a quarter of inch of where they wanted it. So, yeah, it's, 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 it's not as, it's not as crazy as, as sometimes you think. Um, but I don't know if we're there yet, but I guess what I wanted to do is just on the table tonight is, um, and Chris and I need to talk about this in more detail, but. Uh, you know, the ability to build uh, a frame out of composites and then, you know, instead of a plastic deck or a, a recycled material deck, you know, have a wooden deck on top of it. You know, can we get to an aesthetic that's in keeping with the rest of the boardwalk for the user's experience, um, but maybe uses some higher technology to make the span across this creek, this creek work? What is this? You, that's about what, 15 feet? This The creek? The span's what? about 30, it's, it's, we've got it down to about 36 feet. It's a, it's a little under 40. Oh, that way, huh? Yeah, to get safely, um, let me see if I can show you how that sort of works in terms of the drawings. Um, get safely okay. across, kind of zoom in on a part of this down here. And this will have the composite piles for the bridge, correct, Eric? Uh, I, I think we'd have to evaluate that. Chris, I don't, I don't know, I, with going with, um, at this point, if we're going with helical, you know, this might have to be a helicals with a diagonal brace or something that may be something that you need to look at more, Chris, on what type of piles would hold up the bridge. Um, right, if you want to put that off to another discussion for when that's fine with us. Yeah. yeah um, I think what Eric's trying to get at is that it's not going to be like wooden beams like we had before mm -hmm. because we're spanning a bigger distance. Yeah. So we're going to have some of those composite but, uh, com you know, RFP type materials um, in order to do the beams there to get that right. that distance. And then, you know, there may need to be some trussing going on. So the bridge may look a little bit different. We're trying to keep the visual of the planks staying the same, but the sides might be a little right. bit different. Yeah. Right. And there's not much that I think no. can be done. No, about that. The, the impact would only be from the sides and you'd, you'd be standing in the marsh to see it. Uh -huh. the, yeah, you'd, you'd uh, visual for the walker. Good. Right. You'd be on the western side looking back. And, yeah. you know, I think it's nice to see this open and we really don't want to put piles down here, right. you know, in this inlet. You can see this is the 15 foot spacing and we come okay. along and then we go to the 40 here to get across. Uh, and this shows you can see kind of the diagonal bracing that that's kind of what that does is makes up a truss design, which makes it strong and makes the span possible. So we can still have the vertical pickets, but you may see some elements that are diagonal. Um, you know, in that instance, to be able to to make the the span work, I think we can live with that. It might also make sense in that particular one, like you had your picture. Maybe the maybe they are horizontal there. Yeah. Well, I think let, you let the engineers figure that out and come back and tell us what you got. Yeah, we'll come you come back with an update. <laughs> <laughs> As Chris said, you know, one of the one of the considerations is what structural um, shapes are available out of composites. So these are structural shapes, these are channels and tube shapes. Um, you know, it may end up being a combination of a steel plate and, and wood if composites are an availability issue, but this is what we're gonna dig into a little bit more. Okay, sounds good. Um, Kathy, we had on this, uh, that we just talk about the rec commission meeting a little bit and, yeah. and just kind of update on that. Do you wanna start off with that intro? Yeah, I think the, the recreation commission um, really liked the little park there. Uh, Jim did come to the meeting um, and after the meeting, uh, what was prior to us was Sandy Pond Recreation Area and they had this really kind of cool pirate ship play structure um, that Jim thought might be great to have here kind of in Pirate's Cove, the Pirate Museum. Maybe it might make sense to have that here. And then also maybe having some type of of swing uh, versus the, the the glider track or something. Um, so Eric took a look at seeing, you know, could, could he modify this to allow for the potential of having uh, the pirate ship? You got to understand that the pirate ship is about $100,000, just mm -hmm. the ship itself. 
Um, so maybe this is a case where, you know, we're looking at the, um, the beams for now, um, but we want to make sure that we have enough space and area and size it to allow for um, the pirate ship if we can afford it in, in the future. So I don't know if you want to show some of the pictures. Sure. Yeah, and the way we were kind of considering this was the design that we had going into the meeting, which is, is this is the little room in front of the parking, the rivers to the bottom of the, of the slide here. And in this area of kind of these balance beams out of natural timbers, we had a, a play tunnel that kids can crawl through, um, you know, some other features, uh, embankment slide and so on. And after listening to the presentation on, on Sandy Pond, um, really decided, you know, maybe it's something that can work like this, kind of keeping the same ideas and, and including the pirate ship instead of the balancing shapes. Um, maybe we can add, it looks like we can add at least one swing. We were going to look and see if we could get another second swing tucked in here as well. Um, some picnic tables, but the ability to, to have a pirate ship. And, and the one that we saw uh, looks something like this. It was kind of all out of natural timber. There's an example of the swing. Um, and it just seemed like the right site in town to have a pirate ship. That was kind of a key part of that discussion was, you know, probably belongs here close to the river, you know, within sight of the water, it, it makes sense to try to incorporate this element. You can see it's got climbing features, overlooks, you know, a slide. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun to play on for little kids. Um, so I think what Kathy's saying is it is an expensive element. We can design this, this area uh, as a sort of a, this could be done at a later point in time or through fundraising or sponsorship or donation. Um, you know, maybe that comes on, it's not available at the beginning. I think we can be flexible as long as we have the framework of the space uh, designed. If we can get a two for one deal on the purchase from the <laughs> splash pond. Okay. I, I think it becomes really kind of a signature part of the whole area there if you're using a pirate ship, right? You know, it kind of does tie everything that we're kind of water related together. So if we can find a way to do it, I think it'd be cool. We, I think the closer we get moving along, mm -hmm. uh, there might be different types of grants that, that we can apply for. Um, maybe, the, well. maybe the businesses would donate. Yeah, maybe we know, could get the Widow Museum to make a contribution <laughs> and we've right. got to put their sign up there. Right. Well, I, you know, yeah, there's it, that too. And this is where we get to start maybe thinking about having discussions with um, community visions about where their foundation is and what they're doing. And maybe we something we can start working with them and public private partnerships to be able to do some of these things. Like, you know, the pirate ship sponsored by the Witter Museum or sponsored by David Reed, attorney of law, or, you know, Jim Saban, you know, the, the, the slope, <laughs> the slope downward, you know, that, that'd be Jim Saban's uh, slope, Slide. sliding, sliding, sliding slope. downward. Slippery slope. Slippery slope of Saban. Sliding into retirement. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I think the public private is going to give us some opportunities. You know, we look at, I, you know, Eric calls these rooms. So, I mean, if you look to the, so north of that, there's another room that we'll probably want to think about. Uh, it looks like it's got an umbrella in it. It's just to the right of the red square. Mm -hmm. And then we've got our, our uh, artist shanties to that. So mm -hmm. maybe there's some way we're going to have to start thinking about. And to the left of it, there's also another empty room. Um, you know, having discussions about um, public art and, yeah. Oh, yeah. and you know, awesome. memorial benches and those types of fine details. Um, awesome. We'll get to in a few near future, but I think what we've got now is a good framework to to start getting to permitting and uh, yeah. yeah. Eric and I had talked a little bit about public art, and we're actually trying to schedule a meeting with with the cultural center. I think it might be um, seems like Eric has a lot of experience uh, with public art, but just making sure that we've created the right locations for it, not necessarily that it gets incorporated initially, but making sure that we're initial making, planning. Yes, yeah, so yeah. we have it planned out, and, and we can have some good areas where we can say, well, we might be able to have some some public art here. Yeah, I think there's some great opportunities for various locations. I mean, yeah. You know, sculpture but, right along the oh, yeah. way. I mean, there's all and kinds of all crazy great opportunities yeah. along 28. We'll leave it aside for the from the pirate theme. <laughs> well, well, I the think nautical, that, the nautical, nautical theme, yeah, the nautical elements. Element, right. Yeah, I think that being flexible and creating spaces, you know, in some of our projects that involve creating a base, you know, on the ground that art can be installed on top of. 
Um, but it's not necessarily your forever piece. You know, some, sometimes you find a piece of art that will speak to the community that way. Other times it's a rotating piece that's there for a year. Um, and that, that brings people back, right? Because the attractions change, the artwork changes. Um, there's a reason to come back each year and see what, what's have you been to Have you been to Heritage Gardens? Mm -hmm. Heritage Gardens is installed oh, wow. all sorts of public art throughout the gardens. Yeah, wow. And some of them, as Eric said, some of them are permanent. Others are little, you just put them in the ground and go back, you know, mm -hmm. two months later and something else is there. And they're really lovely. And they're not just all flowers and trees. Yeah. Uh, there are all sorts of all sorts of things. Uh, just wonderful ideas. There's one, a teepee on the left-hand side when you walk in. It's unbelievable. And it's made from uh, trash they found on the ground. It's really very wow. clever. Very clever. Super. Okay, so um, we like the idea of the pirate ship. Um, let's talk about. Uh, uh, let's talk about the uh, front entrance. I, I, we've got some. These are this, this kind of final final designs. Well, this, no, this kind of continues from some of the comments from the Recreation Commission with regard to school buses and maybe tour buses. Uh -huh. um, so Eric took a look in the front um, to make sure that there's some turning radius. Races okay. can be yeah. met. So yeah. I just we just wanted to briefly touch on that. Yeah. And also um, one of the things that we have continued on was uh, with the pavement surface at the main entrance. The porous pavement doesn't do great when you're doing a lot of turning movements. And I think you may recall from the feasibility study, we were looking at maybe this beginning entrance here being it's traditional, yeah. being mm -hmm. traditional pavement. So there'll there'll be some stormwater elements um, on the bottom side of the um, of the access way here. Mm -hmm. But I think we just wanted to make sure that, um, to let you guys know that we are trying to make some accommodations for the school buses and and actually for, for some tour buses as well. Right, so let me quickly ask, I noticed in the upper right-hand corner there's a crosswalk that goes across 28. Is, is that um, something we're proposing or is that something the state, do they gonna dictate us to where those crosswalks would be or can we? Yeah, I think yeah, that's we're gonna good... need to coordinate, yeah. Go ahead, Kathy. I was just going to say uh, the the um, the state in their plans did have a crosswalk in this general area. They originally had it uh, to the east side of the entrance, and but we're kind of thinking about it being on the west side. Mm -hmm. I did comment to them that I wanted to coordinate with them because they are going to have those rapid uh, flashing beacons yep. on all of the crosswalks on Route 28, which awesome. is, I think is awesome. Um, so so that is something we will need to coordinate with them. Yeah, and that actually aligns better with the yeah. parking in uh, Captain Park because you wouldn't have people coming out of the north immediately stopping right no it makes sense to have it there Definitely. versus where and i was just because yeah. i think down below the circle where that black dot is right. is that where the existing crosswalk is there's two white lines right there yeah yeah there's there's for the bridge that doesn't right. make sense no. yeah. and you can barely see it that, that was i believe the the temporary one that was well, part of the, the bridge, bridge. i don't bridge. think there was one in yeah. this particular area before okay oh, okay that's good well aside yeah, the, benefit about the crosswalks that i like uh, assuming they have signs, is that even if the uh, park's not being used or whatever, people, most people, not New York tourists, uh, will tend to slow down <laughs> when they see a crosswalk. Especially with blink blinking lights. Can I, can I ask on, on the Recreation Commission meeting, what was their suggestion about bus access to the site? What did they anticipate? What I think they really thought this was going to be a great educational uh, mm -hmm. location for school students. So they wanted to make sure that the, the buses could come in. How would they turn around? Where would they park? Um, I think what we were talking about is they could certainly park on the flexible pavement area on the side as you're going out the dark green area on the screen. Yep. Um, but then the the um, the bigger buses, the the coaches, the coaches, the coaches. they're a little bit bigger than the school buses. Um, so I think we might have to extend some of that paver a little bit around the um, the little cul-de-sac there in order to make sure that they can go around and, and not and, and not go, eat up the yeah the, the, uh, yes. side. Can, can a bus get around that cul-de-sac now? Right, so that's a good question. So it, it can, um, but Kathy's absolutely right. It, so they asked a couple questions. One was a school bus, which which everything that we've been working on with you, school buses work fine. Uh, what they talked then a little bit more about was the interstate bus and the possibility that a larger sort of tourist bus might come into the site, whether that's for an event or whether that's for a, a tour or some kind of special festival. So. We want to look at that. In order to do that, we would take this grass paver treatment, just as Kathy said, and we would extend it. We know it can work. We would extend it around the circle here. So it's okay. just a little bit of a shoulder. It's it's still going to be grass, um, but it would be a little bit stiffer to support the weight of the bus as it turns that circle. They can make that turning radius 
They can. Okay. Yep, they okay. can. And they can do the second cul-de-sac too, all the way down. That's shaped a little bit differently and they can make it um, through that okay. one as well. I think I think the I circled this area. It's this does the the bus does require some modifications here that we we went ahead and made. They were relatively minor. It just changes the geometry of this curve a little bit as people come in. We need to peel this corner back a little to allow those buses to swing in. Um, there's a little bit of overhang, you know, on this plant bed, but with that plant material, we we'll just have to keep it low. Um, and that also assumes they don't swing out. You know, if they swing out into traffic a little bit, uh, which sometimes if there's a gap in the traffic, you know, big buses can do that. They get a little more space to maneuver. Um, they can come in a little more sh straight on and their access would work even better, you know, if they do a little bit of maneuvering at the entrance. Or they could come from the east side. Correct. Yes. That, that works okay as well. Or they could park at Captain Parkers and have lunch and walk across the street in the new, <laughs> in the new walkway. I'm sure Jerry what, loves it. Yeah. One, one, thing, one thing I wanted to mention about this crosswalk, uh, you know, your project won't, oh, won't build this crosswalk, but we do need to kind of plan for it. Um, another benefit of having it there is everyone coming out of here is looking in that direction. If it were to the right with this right movement, uh, if somebody gets a gap in the traffic and wants to pull out and the crosswalk's right here, it, it they like stop could, immediately. Yeah. That could be dangerous. Yeah, or they might not even see the person. So um, that's another reason, just so you understand the background, you know, as to why it's to the to the west. Uh, that's oh, another sure. contributing factor, yeah, as to why it's there. Great. Great. Doing right along. Okay. Doing good. Next. So I think it's just the minutes. Um, okay. Did you have anything else he needs from us before he signs off? No, today, yeah. today was great. Um, I okay. appreciate all the input. And um, I know Chris does too. And we can, we can keep things moving on our end. So thank you. I would just give a, a real brief update that Eric and I met with um, Patrick McDonough, who had been an event sponsor. He'd done the um, Country Fest. Um, and he provided us with some really great information um, on the electrical that's needed for stages and all the things that, um, you know, an actual larger performer might be looking for. So Eric's kind of working on, on making some um, adaptations related to that, but he was super psyched, I think, about what we were doing here and very excited about having um, a future event at the site. So, how did the Pirate Festival thing go? I, I'm sorry, I don't know. So, I've been told it went okay. Um, advertising wasn't as well as it, you know, could have been. Um, it was one day, um, no real major complaints from anybody. The only one was complaints about was. A cannon going off. Um, and they've already stuff. announced dates. They've already announced dates for next year. So obviously they think it's ready. Yeah, there we go. Okay. They want to make this their spot. Yeah, they're very interested in the pirate smile, and they want to be part of that. Yep, I'm waiting for the food truck festival. <laughs> You're gonna have to work. Yeah. Yeah. Get to work, Susan. You got nothing else going on? Um, okay, let me. Um, Thank you guys. Let's look at the minutes, uh, accept the motion to accept the minutes of May 16th. So moved. I have a motion by Susan. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second by David. Uh, roll call all in favor. I'll do a roll call. Uh, all in favor, Susan? Aye. David? Yes. Bud? Aye. Me? Aye. Uh, so it's unanimous. I don't have to ask for the others because I know they're not here. <laughs> um, the only other thing that I wanted to, to um, I don't think I followed up with you, but um, some people were telling me that people are going into the drive drive in site uh, during the fishing area. And yeah, kind of the, driving the, the the contractor yeah. of the of the bridge had there was had been a boulder there and they had mm -hmm. moved it. I coordinated with DPW. They said they were going to move the boulder back. I okay. haven't been out there. I haven't since, either, so, but yeah. when you asked, told me about that, I sent yeah. that around. Yeah, so I don't want people getting out there and getting mischief and then making yeah, and our thinking, lives and miserable. thinking that's the way it's going to be yeah. open like that. Yeah, yeah it, so. it was the contractor moved something. Okay, good. Boulder. Okay, um, next meeting TBD. TBD. Okay, um, that's all I have for now. Kathy, you have anything else? Good. With that uh, let's accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Uh, I'm going to roll call by saying all in favor. Say aye. 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 There we go. We're all in favor. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Very good. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Eric. One and Eric, two. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Chris.